Okay, it looks like it's seven. I think we can go ahead and start the meeting. Okay. I'll do a roll call vote. Committee member Chen? Present. Committee member Larson? Here. Committee member Muhammad? Here. Committee member Peterson? Here. Chair Fassoon? Here. And committee member Breeding is not yet present. Okay, so then it looks like we can go on to our land acknowledgement um, and then dive right into things. So the following land acknowledgement, uh, so the city of Albany recognizes that we occupy the land originally protected by the Confederated Villages of Lijon. We acknowledge the genocide that took place on these lands and must make strides to repay the moral debt that is owed to this indigenous people, specifically the Ohlone tribe. We thank them for their contributions, which have transformed our community and will continue to bring forth growth and unity. The city of Albany commits to sustaining ongoing relationships with the tribe and together build a better future for all that now make this their home. Okay, so then it looks like we can go on to the approval of minutes. These are the minutes from the May 18th meeting. Are there any comments or concerns about the minutes? Doesn't sound like anyone has any. Can I move to approve the minutes? Mm -hmm. I'll second. Okay. Um, committee member Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Aye. Committee member Muhammad? Aye. Committee member Peterson? Aye. Chair Fassoon? Aye. Uh, still no committee member breeding. Motion carries. Minutes okay, approved. With, with that, I think we can move on to public comment. Would any members of the public like to? comment on items not on the agenda. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature on Zoom. I do not see any members of the public with their hand raised. I do see we've been joined by committee member breeding. Okay, back to you, Chair Fasoon. Okay, um, with that, I think we can move on to an item four, which is announcement. Um, we can start with item 4-1, which is sustainability events and resources. Great. Uh, just two announcements for you today, and they're mostly reminders. I wanted to let everyone know that there's free compost available to the entire Alameda County community. Currently, there's one compost hub available, but Stop Waste and other jurisdictions within the county are hoping to open additional compost hubs. Uh, the one in the city of Alameda, uh, you can learn more about it at www.stopwaste.org slash compost dash hubs dash and dash donations. Uh, so this is a basically pile of compost that you can go to and take free compost home to fertilize your garden. And as we all know, carb, uh, compost has incredible benefits at withdrawing carbon from the atmosphere and sequestering it in the soil and in the roots of plants. So I encourage you to learn more about that. Then uh, some electrification for you. Are you considering switching to an induction cooktop or just curious how it works? Borrow an induction cooktop for free from the city of Albany. Induction cooktops are safe, powerful, and environmentally friendly. Try it out for yourself with Albany's free induction cooktop lending program. Contact mplaus at albanyca.org for more information. Those are sustainability events and resources updates. I will pass it to Michelle for an update on multifamily electric vehicle charging pilot program. Yes, I have even more electrification updates. Um, so I'm happy to say that we have been moving along swimmingly with our electric vehicle charging pilot program. And we have selected our three building owners who will be participating in the pilot. Um, 
we received three applications, so it was a very easy choice, but they're all excellent, excellent candidates um, with some variety in the buildings uh, that will help us learn a lot about various building types in Albany through the pilot project. Um, Johnny and I have started speaking with all three of the building owners and going over different charging um, charger technology options, as well as uh, looking into contractors and getting quotes. Um, so that we can make a plan for the actual installations and get cooking. So we're very excited that things have been going well and we're making good progress there. Lizzie, should I uh, move on to my next update too? It looks like we have one question. Can I, can I ask Can I ask your question? Yes. Okay. Um, can you just briefly say what the sizes of the uh, buildings are? Yes, I think we have, Johnny, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have an eight unit and two 12 unit buildings. I believe that's correct. That was um, my recollection as well. I could I could be having it backwards. It might be two eights and one 12 or- I, I think it's an eight and two 12s. That's but great. yeah. Yes. That's, that's great, thanks. Mayor Peterson. Yeah, um, so I had some questions. Uh, how are you assessing, um, you know, the capability of the buildings electrically to support that? I mean, is that part of the um, efforts that are going on? Is that what contractors will be used to do? Yeah, so part of the application process, we asked some kind of basic questions about electrical capacity and, and what electrical appliances are currently in the building. Um, but then the contractors will come and do a much more in-depth analysis of the electrical capacity and um, and give us a better sense of specifically what number and and um, electrical load of chargers the building can support. And then um, what about um, outreach to building occupants, like the actual tenants in the building? Is there was there an assessment of the interest of the tenants in having um, charging ab ability? Yeah, we we asked the building owners to do some outreach through their application process. Um, that that's been somewhat limited so far, but in the the next steps of our process, we'll be doing more detailed outreach with the building occupants. There was a, a question as well um regardless of the surveys that were distributed we also did ask building owners as part of their application and in what was submitted um to state the number of tenants that either have expressed interest in getting an ev or who may already have one but charge elsewhere and i believe that at least one of our buildings already has a, a tenant with an ev along with one who has expressed interest as well. Okay, good. But that, that'll, be, that'll be included in further parts of the program. We'll be um, providing information to tenants about acquiring EVs. Yeah, yeah, we'll be doing that in, in more depth uh, coming up. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. I wasn't um, sure if your hand was just still there. Yeah, yeah, I figured, that's why I said, <laughs> I figured it. Um, just wondering if there was any um, like summary learning from what motivated the owners to enroll in the program? What, what motivated them to want to do this? Yeah, that's a great question. We didn't ask about that specifically in the application, um, but just based on our conversations with them, I think they all think this is really the way of the future and that it's not just going to be a benefit to tenants, but it's really gonna be demanded very soon. Um, so I think they're just really kind of taking advantage of this opportunity because you know, they, they think they're gonna have to do it pretty soon anyways. Um, that's, that's the main thing that we've heard. Any other additions, Johnny? No, no, uh, same sentiment. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice job. That's it's great to see it rolling along. Thanks, Member Peterson. Yeah, another. Yeah, one. I, I had so um, are any of them in 
interested in skin in the game kind of thing. I mean, I know it's a pretty good incentive. We're spending up to 15,000 on their building. And, you know, that's, that's a really big carrot. But again, um, are we doing something to sort of assess how much owners are willing to, to put in? Because the city of Albany isn't going to pay for all the chargers and apartment buildings in Albany. Yeah, yeah. We've made it very clear throughout the process that owners will be required to, to put some skin in the game to, to contribute some funding to the project. Um, the numbers we haven't worked out yet because it depends on the quotes we get and, you know, all kinds of details but that is definitely part of part of the agreement. Great. Well, if there's no more questions, I'll go on to electrification number two, um, <laughs> which is the heat pump rebate program. And I'm excited to announce that this just launched on June 1st. And the um, so the way the eligibility works is that anyone who installs a heat pump that is permitted in the city and they receive their permit on or after June 1st is eligible for the rebate. So that's why the rebate program is now open. You can learn all about the program at albanyca.org slash heat pumps, where we go into quite a bit of detail. Um, and the kind of bullet points are that we are offering a $1,500 for central or ducted heat pumps, uh, $1,500 rebate, sorry, and a $750 rebate for ductless heat pumps, like the similar to a floor wall furnace. Um, we're also offering a $1,000 rebate for panel upgrades that go along with heat pumps, and all of those amounts are doubled for low-income households. And finally, we're also offering a $500 signing bonus for any contractors that sign up with Bayren on or after June 1st. So we're very excited about this new program. Um, there is a very simple application that you can find by going to that website I just announced a moment ago, albanyca.org slash heat pumps. And you can, of course, email or call me if you have any questions or would like to more, learn more. Yes, Mr. Peterson. Yeah, I was thinking about that. So um, is there any sort of, well, I guess we don't need to outreach to people that are planning on, on submitting permits. Um, would this work for ADUs? Yes. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. Oh, OK. So as people come in, and, and, and there's information on this available at uh, the building permit counter. Yeah, that's right. There's there's information available in City Hall at the building or permit counter um, and also online. Um, and we haven't gotten any um, permits yet to do outreach outreach with, but um, we'd do that um, upon receiving applications as well. Um, yeah, but mainly we've just been doing social media outreach and yeah. Um, especially if it would sway people away from using gas. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I'll turn it back to Lizzie. Thanks, Michelle. Um, last update. Uh, last week, the city of Albany provided free indoor waste sorting containers to 30 Albany businesses and multifamily buildings so that local business local business staff and customers can properly sort their landfill waste, food scraps, and organic waste, and recyclables. With proper sorting containers and adequate collection service, businesses can increase waste diversion from landfills, protect the environment, and combat climate change, and comply with state and local recycling and compost laws. A second round of applications are now being accepted on a first-come, first-served basis. Visit www.albanyca.org slash recycle to learn more and fill out an application. And please spread the word because we'd like to increase waste diversion at many of our local businesses. Committee member Peterson. Yeah, so I, um, if I have my own announcement to make, is it okay to um, do that at this time or do, do I have to get it into the agenda ahead of time? Sure, you can make an announcement. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention that on um, June 3rd, I attended uh, the CPUC action meeting in San Francisco at the State Building to present comments um, opposing their 
uh, preliminary decision on the net energy metering three tariff, which would hugely impact and reduce the amount of rooftop solar that would be going in. So, I, you know, I encourage people to follow this issue and to submit your own comments to the CPUC and to the governor because um, the jury's still out on this. And as far as we can tell, the CPUC is on a unbending, unyielding path to impose uh, taxes on solar panels and reduce the amount of credit you get for the energy that you generate. So I'd also, at some point, and this probably has to go into future item, uh, I think we should put together a statement that the city go on record as addressing the CPUC and, and requesting that they change their decision. Any questions on announcements before we go to public comment? Okay, it looks like we can go on to public comment. If any members of the public would like to respond to announcements, please raise your hand. I see we have one member of the public with their hand raised. We'll pull up the clock. Lucinda? Yes. Um, hi, thank you for the update. Uh, just had a question about the heat pump rebate. Um, is there a date when the rebate expires or is it is there a fixed dollar amount so that and as soon as the dollar amount is, is um, uh, used up it there how how, how uh, is how does that going to work? And if there is a certain dollar amount, can you let us know? Um, how much it is. Thank you. Uh, the other other comment I wanted to make is I just want to second uh, committee member uh, Peterson's um, suggestion that we ask the city of Albany to um, issue a formal um, objection to CPUC's proposed uh, solar changes. Thank you. If any other, or Michelle, would you like to respond to that one first? Yeah, happy to respond. Um, so in terms of the funding, at, at a large scale, the program will continue until the funds run out. Um, we've been granted a $40,000 pool of funding, um, at least for this first year. Um, that might be added to later on when it runs out, but for the time being, that's the amount of funding that we have. Um, on an individual scale, once someone applies for the rebate and their application has been approved, then we will reserve their funds for three months while the project is being done, and that can be extended as well. That way, you can know that you have the rebate funding before you actually pay for the project, so you don't have to worry about when exactly the funds run out. Thank you, Michelle. Before we close public comment, would any other members of the public like to speak to any of the announcements? If yes, please raise your hand. Seeing none, back to you, Chair Fasoon. Okay, with that, it looks like we can go on to presentation. Um, so item 5-1, um, looks like we have one presentation today from the Bay Area Redwood presentation. Great. I'll take a brief moment to uh, introduce our special guest, Nicholas Harvey from Bay Area Redwood. Um, Johnny, Michelle, and I had the pleasure of seeing a presentation from Nick at uh, the Northern California Recycling Association Conference back in March. Um, won't spoil what Nick does, but it's some pretty cool stuff. Uh, 
and we just want to put this on the committee's radar in case there are any opportunities down the line to repurpose any of the trees that may need to be taken down in Albany um, to be repurposed and reduce their environmental impact. So without further ado, Nick, please take it away. Thanks, Lizzie. Uh, is my screen being shared or do I request that? Let me see. Real I can quick. share your screen. Okay, let me see here. Uh, or would you like to share your own screen? I will share my own screen if that's... Uh, yeah, you should okay. be able to. Okay, let me click that. Uh, you know what? I'm going to let you share it and I'll talk to the slides if that's okay. Totally. It's messing up. Yeah. It said desktop or application. All this technical stuff. There's a different app every time. No worries. Let's um, just... Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, what we do is we recycle trees that come down in the urban environment that would otherwise enter the waste stream. And you'll learn a little bit about this in the presentation. Uh, there are quite a few slides here, but we're going to go through them pretty quickly. Um, we'll have some time at the end for questions. And uh, if anyone does have questions, please ask. Uh, so uh, first off, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm the founder of Bay Area Redwood, and uh, I had this idea when I saw trees being thrown away one day. Uh, if you search my house on Google Maps, you can actually see me out in my front yard, uh, basically where I turn my backyard into a lumber yard. Uh, we've grown quite a bit since then a few years ago. Uh, next slide, uh, Lizzie. So the problem is, is that every day, urban trees are entering the waste stream. Next slide. Uh, here is actually uh, basically a lay down yard for West Coast arborists in French Camp right outside of Stockton. This is what's called a tub grinder and basically they take trees and just chip them. While they do have an urban wood recycling program, uh, my understanding is they produce up to about 800 tons of green waste per day in the state of California through all their operations. Um, and there's a need for urban wood which we'll get into. Next slide. And why there's a need for urban wood is we have the climate problem in front of us. We're going out to other countries and deforesting their lands, whether it's exotic hardwoods from Central America, uh, South America, or, or Central Asia, or sorry, uh, Southeast Asia, and basically taking those uh, wood, the uh, forest, turning them into wood, importing them here, and then putting those in people's homes. And we have actually, I want to say exotic, you know, some of them aren't local to here. They're planted as ornamental trees, and they have great, amazing properties, and we'll get into that. Uh, next slide. And so the solution is we should be recycling our urban trees um, and ultimately turning those into wood when possible is the highest and best use. Um, of course, they can be made into compost, like Lizzie talked about, but uh, the reality is, is that there's a lot of compost around, and they can't give enough away free. Um, so, uh, why urban wood is really important, this is a type of embodied carbon that can be used as a building material, quite literally it's a green building material from our built environment. So we can take trees that were planted and then ultimately use those as building materials in the built environment. Next slide. The simplest uh, example of this is a type of direct adaptive reuse. This is a tree removal job in Castro Valley on the left-hand side. Large redwood tree. Um, this one was impacting the foundation of the house to the right. There's a thing called right tree, right place. Um, this is actually the wrong tree, wrong place. Uh, redwood trees will get, you know, four, five foot in diameter in 40 to 50 years. Um, after that tree was felled, the logs were uh, staged by the crane in the second photo, and the tree was milled on site. And then the homeowner actually created a fence right from that tree. So on the panel, uh, the third panel to the right, on the part that you see the fence is not double walled on the right hand side where that tree used to be. Um, and so while this isn't exactly a scalable solution and not everyone needs a new fence, this was an opportunity to turn someone's tree that was causing a problem directly into a fence. Next slide. So in most cases, people don't need their trees. 
uh, this is another example where there is not just one, but six redwood trees also causing uh, a problem with the foundation. And these are only like 40 years old. Uh, what particularly happens is when they get into like a water table, they get even bigger. Uh, this one's right next to, I believe, Bollinger uh, Creek over in San Ramon or one of the water tables over there. Um, here, what you're gonna see is the same crane actually, uh, same vendor, and then this is what's called a log loader in front. And so those logs were loaded into the truck. And so this is an example of sourcing from individual homes. Next slide. Uh, next, uh, so sourcing from individual homes, um, we do all the time. Uh, we tried another removal last week of four trees, but even larger scale than this is large developments. Uh, we have a flagship retail showroom in San Ramon, and it came to our attention that in the Bishop Ranch office part, that uh, a lot of the office buildings were being taken down um, for what's called the City Village uh, project by Summerhill Homes at Bishop Ranch 6 or BR6, you see in the top left inside. And they literally took down every single one of the office buildings. So in the top right panel, you see one of the redwood trees being felled. In the bottom left panel, you'll see basically just some of the logs move over to the side with excavators in the background. Now in the bottom right panel, what you're gonna see is an excavator loading some of those logs uh, into the truck. And you can see a tiny person in the background in between the excavator's arm uh, at the bottom part of that. Uh, next slide, Lizzie. And so part of this solution is actually our log recycling yard. This is in June of 2021. And I know it doesn't look like there's very much wood. Um, so let's go to the next slide. This is in March of this year, just a few months ago. And actually those logs that are being dropped off by the high side end dump for the 18 wheeler are actually from that job site over in San Ramon, I was just showing you. There's an infinite amount of waste. And this is all wood that can be sourced locally here from the urban environment. And there's a need for it. Um, and so the question is, is, what is the goal? And based off the goal is the processing steps in order to make things from that material. Different materials have different material properties and different uses in different processing. Next slide. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our capabilities and basically the mills can process differently and types of wood that can be made. Next slide. So one of the mills is called a Lucas mill. This is kind of like a Swiss army knife. You can actually bring it into someone's backyard. That's the one you saw that was cutting uh, on the uh, street and the direct adaptive reuse slide. Uh, this is basically a mill that um, you can change out the cutter head on it. And in this one, it has what's called a swing blade. So it's a 20 inch circular saw blade um, and it can pivot 90 degrees. And it has a maximum cut depth of eight inches. So what you're seeing is a circular log being turned into rectangles essentially or dimensional lumber. And so you can see as this log is being opened up and this is a relatively clear log, meaning that there's quite uh, not very many knots in it. Next slide. That same mill can have a different attachment put on it. This is like a chain attachment. And what that does is it cuts slabs, things for like a tabletop. Next slide. Uh, yet a different mill, and actually both of them run in the Lucas mill in the background, uh, as well as what's called a Woodmiser LT70 super wide hydraulic portable bandsaw mill. A bandsaw mill is different. Um, it's not as portable as that other mill, which can be built anywhere. Uh, you have to be able to pull it up with a trailer. What's nice about this mill though, is it's a production saw mill. So it has a hydraulic log roller. So you'll see on the right side that it's not a perfectly circular log. It's actually oblong, uh, as you can see and uh, not all logs are actually cylinders. And the first three cuts have been made, which is the pieces to the left of the log that have been pulled down on the hydraulic log roller. Um, and then basically this one cuts a lot quicker, um, but it, it can only cut, you know, say like 32 inches or something like that. So it has to have logs of a certain size, whereas the other mill can go up to about five foot in diameter. And so uh, the point being is there's different tools, right? And those different tools depend on what the scope of work and what the needs and the end goal is. Um, next slide. Um, and so there's a million different ways to recycle the log, right? And so we're gonna talk about some of our projects and examples. Next slide. Here's dimensional lumber that was cut on the Lucas mill. 
Uh, this is at uh, Cafe Ohlone, uh, which is soon to open at UC Berkeley. Uh, we're going to get some sneak peeks, so some behind the scenes. Uh, you'll, this is designed by Terramoto Landscapes, so you'll see kind of the overview on the left. And next slide. Uh, you see it in progress or construction on the left, which is um, the Ramada structure. Uh, and then on the right hand side, uh, almost all, well, now all furniture has been delivered. There's more seats and benches, but all the tables have been done. Um, and my understanding is that uh, the first opening to the public is going to be in July. Um, so really exciting. And they're at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology. It's a very symbolic um, you know, opportunity. Uh, for Cafe Lone and Makam Ham um, is, you know, at the beginning of this meeting, recognizing that we are on Ohlone lands and there's a variety of different tribes uh, throughout. So just like there's Lashan, um, there's the Verona Ben, the Muwekma, uh, Rumzen, uh, which actually go all the way down to Monterey. Um, so what's going to be really amazing about Cafe Ohlone is that you're going to be able to learn about Ohlone culture and foods at this space and it's going to be a very immersive educational experience. And uh, we're very fortunate to be selected as a material supplier and a uh, really strong supporter. So please come join us. Um, next slide. Um, we recently just rewarded a contract uh, for Hayward Lanier Park. Um, so in the top left is the rendering going back many, many months. Uh, the top right is some of the logs that are going to be selected for stumps. And the bottom part is the new updated rendering actually from that meeting um, by Surface Design, the landscape architect uh, for that project. And uh, we're going to be delivering that, it looks like, early July. Um, and so Hayward Linear Park is in Sohe or South Hayward um, on Mission Boulevard. We enter from Union City. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we also do commercial projects in addition to municipal. Uh, so this is a project we did um, at Sanford's new hospital a couple of years back um, in Redwood City off Bay Road. And uh, we did a whole bunch of stumps as well as planter boxes. Um, and uh, they didn't tell us, by the way, that we like finished these like coffee tables and I buried them underground. That photo doesn't look nearly as cool as this one, but uh, communication, right? Um, but anyways, um, next slide. Uh, we do interior furniture as well. Uh, this is a dining table uh, from Valley Oak, salvaged from the west side of Alamo, uh, with a few reclaimed uh, Douglas fir, Doug fir blocks, standard framing lumber. Um, chairs, not by us, uh, no idea. But anyways, um, next slide. Um, and then we also work with unconventional materials. So even though we're called Bay Red, we use oak and Doug fir. Um, so. Let's go into the next slides and we're going to talk about blue gum eucalyptus, a tree everyone says can't be used. So uh, one day uh, in early 2021, I had never been a fish ranch road and I'm like, let's just go check this out. I heard there's some logs over here and uh, we wandered upon these 1900 logs that were decked as part of the Claremont Canyon evacuation support project, a Cal Fire grant that UC Berkeley got um, from the SCU field office. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, what are they going to do with them? Uh, the answer is a lot of them went into the waste stream, but we were able to recycle about 50 of those logs. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of those projects about the tree. People say it can't be used. And the answer is that it can't. Next slide. Uh, our flagship project is actually in downtown Livermore at the Quest Science Center Plaza, uh, adjacent to Stockman's Park. And this is a rustic style fence made out of blue gum eucalyptus. Um, it has a nice like grayish patina that's starting to set on it now. This photo is taken in, uh, in July or so of uh, last year, 2021. Um, we also made a couple picnic tables uh, here as well. Um, and it's actually dimensionally stable. There's no problem. It's uh, doing great. And uh, go check it out, I'd say. Uh, next, and that's in a, in a wide public space. Uh, next slide. Um, we've also supplied a couple of local contractors made planter boxes out of it. Um, again, uh, absolutely fine. There is notes. You can't just use all of the eucalyptus. You have to mill it in a certain way. And a variety of things with the curing. It's not as easy to work with, let's say like redwood or cedar, um, but it can be used. Next slide. 
Oh, uh, back one side. Um, so also retaining wall material. So you'll see a before and after of uh, Blue Gum Eucalyptus uses retaining wall material. Uh, this is up in the Hayward Hills. Uh, next slide. And we recycle 100% of our waste. Um, this one has both redwood on the left and blue gum eucalyptus on the right. So on that photo showing where the Lucas mill was cutting dimensional lumber, when you cut on the outer edges of a circular log, you get triangular shaped pieces. Um, and depending on how big a cut you're making, those can serve as rails or posts. So on the left-hand photo, you see a great example of a split rail fence on the right that's been oxidized a little bit. And then you see the live edge kind of fencing used from our waste, but it's not really a waste. And so and there's several Eagle Scout projects uh, that we worked with, with the Friends of Sawzall Creek and the Sawzall Creek watershed of Joaquin Miller Park up in Oakland Hills. Um, next slide. Oh, uh, I guess we're done. So, you know, our mission is to keep trees out of the waste stream, right? All of these trees can be useful materials. The question is, is it what is the need or what is the goal? And we believe um, that you know the best use for urban trees when they come down is as urban wood. Now it doesn't always work. It depends on site access. It depends on the need. It depends on a variety of different factors. How far do you have to move it? And we recognize you can't recycle every single tree, but we believe that it at least should be considered when possible. Um, so, you know, we can go all the way from that tree removal to finished product and that's really our expertise. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Um, so you talked about dimensional lumber. You can't, do you ever, um, your stuff is sort of visual or landscape type use. You can't use it structurally, right? Because it isn't graded. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the biggest challenges. And essentially, like, I can make two by fours for you to build a house with. And funny enough, I was actually, I'm talking with a structural engineer right now. And what he's going to do is he's going to grade the panels. So he's not going to grade the lumber. By grading the panels, you don't. So the problem is you need someone to sign off on something. So you answer the question, or you hit on it, the nail on the head in the very first part of it with the landscaping there's no problem or no questions asked for lack of better terms. When you get into interior, for example, we did a huge deconstruction project in San Francisco, which I talked about uh, at the NICRA presentation that uh, Lizzie was talking about. And this old growth redwood we reclaimed was up in a warehouse since the 1940s. And then I had a huge developer that's working on one of the biggest developments in SF, you know, big skyscrapers say, what's the flame spread rate on this material? And I'm like, I don't know, it was up in a building for 80 years. And so the problem is you can just send it to a lab, uh, basically the American Society of Testing Materials or ASTM to do a flame spread rating test. And it's like, that's $10,000. And then the project says, I can't pay for that. And it's like the cost for that stamp is more than the material. And so um, that's one of the central challenges actually for urban wood on interior uses. However, if you use it as furniture, then it's okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. The other, the other question I had was just with, um, you know, we actually had, uh, uh, we have an urban forester in Albany and it's not the current guy, the one before. He did a lot of salvaging. I had a uh, tree, uh, I guess it was a, not a camphor, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a camphor tree. And he cut it into planks for me and aged it and brought it back a couple of years later. I made a bench out of it and it was really pretty nice. So I think, and he made a lot of benches in, in the parks around. So I think uh, a lot can happen if the on staff folks are motivated that way. Um, I haven't seen much of that happening in Albany anymore, but it, it, it's very, uh, we do take down trees. I mean, all the time. Are certain trees um, more prone to deterioration? And, and like redwood, we know has tannins that make it resistant to rot pretty much. But is the eucalyptus resistant to rot? It is. So it's not necessarily resistant to bugs, 
but it's resistant to rotting. I would put my money on eucalyptus over redwood any day in terms mm -hmm. of long-term use. Um, it is super hard. It's 50% harder than oak, actually. It is not easy to work with. And what that means is that it costs more money to process it. You don't get as high of a yield because you have to mill it in a specific way, which means that you have more green waste produced during the milling process. And to be very clear, milling is not 100% yield. There is green waste produced. And that's, for example, the second to last slide where I showed how we're trying to find ways to utilize all of our waste. And so to answer your question, yeah, there's, it's almost, I'm in the process of working with another company about kind of making like a field atlas of you have this species and it's this size and you can turn it into these things. And here are examples or projects. Um, and ultimately that's actually be targeted toward landscape architects that are more environmentally focused mm -hmm. utilizing uh, materials. So uh, my background is actually chemistry and material science and that's kind of have a little bit deeper of an insight. So different tree, different species, different material properties. Yeah, oh, that's great, thank you. You're welcome, Ben. Committee member Larson. Yeah, hey, thanks. Um, this is really cool um, idea. Um, as, as with many of these environmental friendly kind of initiatives like that, there's a there's often a price disadvantage to doing this. So a you know, cost to whoever's using the lumber, you know, choice between buying new lumber versus buying this you know, reclaimed lumber. What do you have an idea of like, what is that cost gap like in percentage or, you know, like, I, I'm just wondering how big the hill is that people have to climb to get to using this. Yeah, uh, Lizzie, can I have you go back to the first slide on direct adaptive reuse? So I think what Member Larson's asking is like it costs more money to use our services than it does to like buy new wood, and I'm going to say that's false. And oh, good. An exact example. Good. Uh, and like y'all can go on Google right now and price check me, okay? So uh, I was making an assumption there. So <laughs> yeah, no, 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 you're good, you're good, and that's like everyone gets this, and no, no, no. so. Um, I think it's 20 pickets per side. They're 19 foot lengths or 19 and a half foot, uh, one by eights. Maybe it's one by sixes. I think it's one by eight. So, uh, this job costs about $4,000 for the milling services, not the tree removal. We're referring to milling. Now, remember that it would have cost more money to throw away the tree than it would to mill the tree. Okay. Oh, okay. So, folks, 4000 Uh, he got something like, uh, a hundred and something. 19 foot long one by eight fence pickets. So what I would advise doing is go to Ashby Lumber, look up, you know, Con Hart, Rough Sawn Redwood, and look at the lineal foot price of one by eight. And you'll see that it's like, I don't know, like I think uh, three bucks a foot or something like that. So each one of those pickets was like 60 bucks a piece. So we milled something like $8,000 of the wood for the guy, like 4,000 bucks. So you got oh. wood at 50% of the price. Now, oh he had a whole bunch of wood. So it doesn't make sense if you only have a little bit of wood. So it has to pencil out, which goes back to the need. So it's a great question you ask. It doesn't always work. It depends on how much volume of material you have and what is the site access to get it out. Because you have to understand that it usually costs money to throw away the green waste. Uh -huh. So you can reallocate that money towards processing the green waste, i.e. the log, into urban wood. So the answer to your question is that you can save a lot of money or it can cost a lot of money. Okay. It depends on app. Did that answer your question from a high level? Yeah, yeah, it does. And 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 thank you for framing it that way because you know my default assumption was that you know a lot of these programs have to be subsidized because it costs more than the you know than the than the raw lumber would have would have cost you and you have to incentivize people to do that. I mean we're we're dealing with this all the time in our climate action committee. So I would that's why I I was, you know, anticipating like what can the city do to, you know, help this program or whatever like that. But if there's actually a, a financial incentive, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. And, and actually, the really big challenge is for like a retail customer like that. That one turned out just to be a really good story. Like, we don't really do that as much anymore because retail customer asks so many different questions, right? All I need to know is how big is your tree, based off the. DBH, aka the number uh, diameter of breast height, or how the diameter, not the circumference. And even when you ask, tell people to say diameter, they still give you the circumference. I don't know why. It, of a tree, 
like, unfortunately, math and finances are not something that's teach a lot in our society, but that's a little tangent, but I'm not trying to convince people to use our service. I know when it makes sense for someone. And I tell people, I'm not like a barber telling you to get a haircut. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it's kind of like a take it or leave it sort of thing. It depends going back to Council of Predecents. Hey, what does it matter what species you have? Well, yeah, like redwoods, a higher valued species than eucalyptus. So eucalyptus, you have to put more money into processing it. And you have a stigma with that material. Whereas redwood is that it makes a lot more sense, but it depends on how much volume of wood you have known as the board foot, which is what is in the commodities jargon and how wood sold. So based off that diameter of breast height tells you the diameter, how much volume of wood you have, and therefore how much can be made. And based off the site access tells you which mill and how it'll be processed and what potential resources or heavy equipment has to be deployed, perhaps in addition to a mill. So there's not really a hard and fast like, oh, do this. It's kind of like, if this and this and maybe that. It's a much more nuanced answer, unfortunately. And there's not really a lot of, kind of, that's where my specialty is coming, is understanding, given what you have, whether it makes sense or not. If that, to try and answer both of your questions uh, and actually combine them together. And I know that Councilman Peterson said that he wasn't sure that staff had been working on this much. My experience with Lizzie, Michelle, and Johnny, as well as Margot, and I think John. Yes. Um, they've been extremely interested. Uh, and many kudos, they reached out and followed up with us. Um, and really excited for this opportunity and grateful to be able to talk about this. So I just wanted to make sure I gave that shout out um, because I, I believe there is an interest and we would love to be involved in any potential opportunities and really educate. Um, the California Urban Forest Council works across the state to actually educate, not only to grow the urban forests primarily, but urban woods become a new initiative. They have a couple of PDF flyers about basically growing trees as city assets and keeping them alive. But another one of those is grow once benefit twice about recycling trees and be more than happy to share those PDFs, um, which are provided actually for local cities um, and special districts and what have you. And another resource is uh, Cal Fire's Community and Urban Forestry Program, and I have a lot of contacts actually there, both with the uh, Bay Area urban forester as well as the state urban forester, uh, Walter Passmore, who's in charge of running uh, basically the California Urban Forest Master Plan, um, and uh, it, like basically putting out the strategic uh, vision for the uh, QFAC. I'm trying to remember the California Urban Forest advisory, I don't know, some strategic plan. I, name, I can give you the acronym, can't give you the name. <laughs> so that, that's a good segue. I had one last um, question. So, are, you know, I, I get the thing where someone has the tree and you do this service and you mill it and they end up with, and they have a need for that. But then you were talking retail customer. I mean, the other thing is you get these logs from various locations and you're producing product. It could, is there a service for cities like ours where you, you know, we could say, gee, we're thinking of putting certain kind of uh, park benches in and we're getting rid of these trees, can you give us X board feet of material out of these trees? Is that sort of a service you provide? Absolutely. And oh. so you could, and that's where having that need from here's what we have, and here's a thing that we're going to do in X period of time. And that actually gets back to like, you know, redwood, you can cut it and immediately use it. You know, fences are fresh cut green redwood. Eucalyptus, on the other hand, you kind of want to let it cure a little bit. Um, so different material, pro different materials have different uh, parameters and how they need to be handled and treated and processed. And so absolutely that can be done, but depending on that species is going to tell you and, and what your goal is and what you want to make, what needs to be done. Yeah, well, I, I'm glad to hear that. And John is our, that's John um, Hawksbury. What, what's his name? Hawkridge. Hawkridge, yeah. So he's our urban forester. So you're in touch with him and he's aware of yours. That's good to, good to know. So I look forward to seeing um, Albany trees used for Albany purposes. 
Absolutely. And, you know, one of the biggest things, right, is that, you know, in the urban forest movement, right, and just trying to be honest here, it may not in some cases be the smartest thing to take a tree, move it out to our yards in Livermore, and then move it back to Albany. And there are other people local and that one could come and mill on site, depending if there's a service yard or, you know, there's like we were with Ponderosa Millworks and West Oakland. So it may be that we could help in advising in some cases and even help get you with local vendors. Um, not trying to say that we don't want business. Of course we want business, but part of the urban wood movement is that essentially what makes it so competitive to answer customer Larson's question is if you don't have to transport it, that's one of the biggest cost savings. So customer Larson, just think about how much work it would have been to move that much wood to that guy's house over Castro Valley. It's up a really steep hill too, by the way. And so that's what makes urban wood pencil out is when you don't have to move it. And that's the biggest thing I'm trying to communicate here. And, you know, a lot of our wood comes from thousands of miles away. So you're really paying for trucking at the end of the day. And ultimately there's a lot of, you know, greenhouse gases associated with that trucking, needless to say. Mini member Chen. Uh, yeah, one question I had, um, I'm not sure how much insight you have into urban forestry plans that various cities produce. We're relatively early on in kind of the next iteration of the urban forestry plan that we're working on. And I'm just kind of curious, are there any things that you feel like are often missing from urban forestry plans that you would like to see? And I'm also kind of curious, like, you know, I think our plan has several high level components. One is sort of like defining the goals of the urban forestry program. One is like coming up with city inventory and determining, you know, what we, what trees we have. Um, and yeah, I guess how, how does your organization interact with urban forestry plans from, from municipalities? Yeah, great question. I'm going to break that into two parts. I'm going to put that into it really goes into three parts. There's the planning, the trees going in the ground. Then once the trees are in the ground, it's so that's planning. Then there's management. Management fits into public works. That's maintaining of the trees. It's easy to get trees on the ground. It's the maintenance of the first three years and watering them. That's actually the key that everyone is talking about, by the way. And then the third part of that, which is really what I specialize in, is that once the tree needs to come down, we can go from managing that all the way to finished product, which is what I think Councilmember Peterson was asked about, right? So in the first part of planning, great question. I am not an expert. I'm not an arborist, okay? I'm very clear about that, but I'm learning quite a bit being in this industry and uh, serving on the Board of California Urban Forest Council. We actually have a on-site board meeting on Friday. I want to be in San Diego so I can get you to the right people is what I'm trying to say. Here's questions that are being asked right now. Everyone says, hey, let's plant natives, let's plant natives, let's plant natives. That's great. Here's the problem. Our climate's changing. They say LA is going to be more like San Diego. The Bay is going to be more like LA. You know, Oregon and Seattle are going to be more like the Bay, and it goes up. Okay. What that means is that what used to grow here and what is supposed to grow here may or may not grow here. So, what's happening in what's called the Western chapter of the ISR International Society of Arboriculture? Culture? Uh, ISA being the whole organization, WCSA being the Western chapter, is what trees should we be planting looking into the climate crisis that we are in? And yes, there's debates and contentious, but essentially these are tree scientists saying, what should we do? I don't know those answers. Um, I know John was actually uh, just at the WCSA conference in Oakland. I missed him. Um, but uh I'm sure that he's up to speed on that. So that's the planning part, okay? Then there's the management part and the tree inventory like you're talking about. That's basically making sure that you take care of your trees and you manage liability and manage the assets the city has. And then lastly, there's, you know, what do you do when the trees come down? So how I can help is California Urban Forest Council works to expand the urban forest statewide and they have a whole bunch of resources. Um, you know, we do need to be watering our trees during the drought. 
Um, we don't need to be overwatering them, but there are guidelines and basically have sheets to put out because we don't manage our trees. They can ultimately end up dying, which then means that as we lose our urban forest canopy, that ultimately our environment gets hotter, which then furthers climate change. So um, there's a big front page article in the LA Times about this as well. So it is important to take care of our trees, even though we are in drought and we do need to conserve water. So that's the first thing. And there's climate appropriate trees and what have you. Um, that's on kind of, you know, man who can take care of it. Where I can help is on the recycling and that's my specialty. So the two resources are gonna be the California Urban Forest Council and the second one being CAL FIRE's Community and Urban Forestry Program. The Bay Area Urban Forester is Tanner Marr. He's new into that role. Um, he actually has a very keen interest in urban wood utilization and does have uh, experience previously as a forester uh, with a few different uh, forestry companies and forest product manufacturers. Um, and then the state urban forester is Walter Passmore, um, who is in charge of basically administering the uh, urban forest plan for the state of California. Did that uh, answer, I think it's Councilmember Chen, is that right? Yeah, um, thanks so much. Yeah. If there are no other questions from the committee, uh, maybe we'll open it up to public comment. Chair Fassoon? Yeah, let's open it up to public comment. A quick note, actually, Lizzie. Um, yeah. I know Councilmember Chen was talking about the urban forest plan. I know that I was going to introduce you, I think, to Tanner and Walter. Um, do you think that it might be relevant to include Councilmember Chen on that, or anyone else that might be interested in that introduction? I actually mentioned to them uh, that I was chatting with y'all, and um, he, he said that he would love to be connected and engage with the City of Albany, so that actually has kind of already started to happen. Um, is there anyone else you would like me to connect uh, in addition to uh, just let me know? I think just due to, um, Nick, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Brown Act, but it restricts how we can communicate via email outside of public meetings. So maybe just to be safe, just send it to me and then I can forward it to any um, committee members who would like to see it. Understood. Perfect. But thank you for the offer. Yep. Great. So this time, if any members of the public would like to uh, speak to this item, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature on Zoom. Okay, I see one hand. David Wemmer. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a civil engineer with structures background, so I couldn't help but not want to just have some general comments on the use of eucalyptus. Um, uh, you know, yeah, eucalyptus, it, it uh, you know, lasts a long time because it's so damn dense. You know, it doesn't have the tannins like redwood or cedar, but it's just so dense, the water can't get in there and the bacteria can't grow. Um, but that's also why it's not, hasn't been used as, a, as lumber to date because it's so damn dense. Um, you know, mills, they burn up their saws and, and, and such uh, trying to mill the stuff. If you ever try to put a chainsaw through some eucalyptus, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you'll just, you'll burn up your blade on the first cut on your log, and then uh, and I assume the same thing with uh, you know if you cut it into two by fours and you can try and drive a nail through it. I mean, you're probably going to bend your nails before you get the the, the nail to pierce through. So um, I mean, I'm I'm hoping uh, you know that uh, you know uh, what I'm saying isn't maybe is it has been mitigated with you know newer technologies and such, and you know we can use eucalyptus uh, more. Um, especially since, you know, uh, redwood is just, you know, way you know, too expensive, um, really. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I vote for, you know, saving the redwood forest and I'd, I'd use uh, eucalyptus um, uh, in similar uh, uh, um, situations as redwood if, if, you know, you could actually, you know, you could actually work with it, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of um, skeptical, but, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to, um, you know, learn more about it. And um, thank you, Good, excellent presentation. Thank, thank you. Do you want me to respond to any of that? I actually do have some uh, funny stories, uh, which might be relevant for him. Um, let's just do one more call to see if anyone else wants to comment and then we'll respond to everything at once. Um, at this time, if any other members of the public would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, feel free to respond, Nick. Okay, 
Uh, it is very hard, to say the least. Um, there's something known as Jenga hardness. And essentially, it's, a, it's an arbitrary scientific experiment. And it basically tells you how hard a piece of wood is. Uh, eucalyptus is about 50% harder than oak. And oak is known as very hard wood. Um, so to make that fence at Quest Science Center Plaza, I heard they went through three or four blades as they kind of chamfered the top of the skill saw and went through and cut it. It is very hard on tools. What that means is that you go through a lot of consumables. So my comment about it costing more to process, it doesn't mean that it can't be used. It means that there's a higher cost going back to the questions that council members Peterson and Larson had. The second part of that, in order to use eucalyptus, you need to mill it in a very specific grain orientation. You need quarter sawn material that's free of the heart center. It's not rocket science. It just means it, it changes how much yield you can get. Um, I think Lizzie actually held a piece. Y'all want me to bring over the piece of wood to show y'all? I'm at my warehouse now. It's really heavy. I don't know if y'all can hear it. And it drops down. So this is a good piece over here, and this is not a good piece. Good piece. Cortisone orientation, good and straight, everything's good to go. I keep this one as a memento because it's a really funny story. Uh, it was also used for some park bench material, hence these holes are made, and we retrofitted another, like, uh, basically bench, right? And someone, the shop that we'd send it out to, had accidentally cut a piece too small, so they just came to our yard and grabbed more wood, and I wasn't here. So they just said, oh, I'm going to grab wood. See, when we milled the wood, we didn't actually, we just learned, right? Well, this piece has the pith of the tree in it. And you can actually see the pith all the way down this piece of wood. So it's dimensionally stable where it's quarter sawn to the side of the pith, but where the pith of the tree is. So this is a bad piece of wood. And the reason I keep this one around is actually to show just that. So the point being is that, again, you can't use all the material. This goes back to the material science of the different trees and different species and material properties. Um, just want to see if anyone had any questions before I put these back up. No questions at this time. Any comments from the committee or anything else before we uh, close this item and thank Nick for joining us? Great. Well, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, I encourage everyone to check out Bay Area Redwood. And like I said, um, we really just wanted to bring this forward tonight as an informational item for now, but uh, we would love to see uh, a partnership between the city and Bay Area Redwood if possible, because it aligns with our goals of uh, reducing consumption and waste and greenhouse gas emissions and the climate action and adaptation plan. So if you hear more about this in the future, uh, you have a reference presentation. So thank you, Nick, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Nick. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. See ya. All right, back to you, Chair Fassoon. Uh, do we open it back up to public comment or do we just keep going? Uh, we are moving on to discussion. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyone else have comments or question? Oh, um, discussion item 6-1. Oh. oh, sorry. I thought we were doing. Okay. Um, item 6-1. Uh, so, a proclamation of appreciation for Harshita Mira Venkatesh. Yes. I will pull up my screen. For those who have not yet heard, uh, Harshita Mira Venkatesh uh, unfortunately is or has at this point moved out of the city of Albany and um, unfortunately you're no longer to continue your uh, position on the committee if you're not an Albany resident unless you're a student member um, but to honor her service we'll be reading a proclamation of appreciation so this is a proclamation of appreciation to Harshita Mira Venkatesh for her service on the climate action committee 
Whereas Harshita Miravenkatesh began her service on the Climate Action Committee in October 2021, and whereas Miravenkatesh served as vice chair of the committee from January 2022 to May 2022, and whereas as an active member of the Point of Sale Electrification Mandate Subcommittee, Miravenkatesh prepared and presented subcommittee updates to the committee and co led discussions, and Whereas Mira Venkatesh's de demonstrated commitment to equity and advanced climate change solutions was inspirational to the committee, and whereas during her term of service, Mira Venkatesh was influential in achieving the city's sustainability goals, including influencing implementation of the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, and whereas Mira Venkatesh is recognized by the committee for her thoughtfulness and dedication to sustainability and for her commitment to making Albany a more environmentally responsible city. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Climate Action Committee does express its appreciation to Harshita Miravenkatesh for her service to the Climate Action Committee and wishes her to the City of Albany and wishes her the best in her future endeavors. At this point, um, if there's a motion to adopt the proclamation, I'll make a motion. I'll second. Uh, committee member Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Aye. Committee member Muhammad? Aye. Committee member Peterson? Aye. Chair Fassoon? Aye. Motion carries. At this point, if anyone would like to say any uh, words of appreciation, now would be a good time. Yeah, I, I, I worked with um, Rashida on, on uh, the mandate, the uh, point of sale mandate, and she was very helpful in that. I, I always, you know, I, I do regret that she wasn't able to find a place in Albany and stay on the committee because I think she was really interested in continuing. So, um, but she was very helpful in pulling those ideas together, and, and uh, she's a great person to brainstorm with. So I'm going to miss her. Yeah, I'd like. I'd also like to add that working with Harshita has been really great, and she has like a ton of really unique ideas, and she's just overall like a really kind and um, amazing person who genuinely really enjoys and cares about the work that she does, and that's very obvious throughout all the times that I've worked with her in the past. So I'm really gonna miss working with her. Wonderful. This time, Chair Fasoon, we can open it up to public public comment if there are any. Yeah. If any members of the public would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. Seeing none, back to you, Chair Fasoon. Okay, um, it looks like we can move on to item 6-2 which is the home electrification mandate proposal staff feedback. Yes. And we did prepare some slides. So let me pull those up. Okay. okay. So it's a little bit of a role shift here because typically um, staff comes to the committee with questions um, and gathers feedback, but this is kind of a role reversal. The subcommittee slash committee proposed a proposal to staff and we analyzed it and we are coming back with questions um, that we think the committee as a whole and the subcommittee should review in greater detail before presenting the proposal as a whole to the city council. Um, so we'll provide those questions and feedback uh, in the next few slides, and then we encourage the committee to discuss um, some of the high level questions and then um, if the committee sees fit delegate to the subcommittee uh, further analysis to answer some of those questions. So we broke it up into three sections, the first being logistics and timing. Um, and we apologize if we missed anything in the proposal. If it's a quick answer, please let us know. But um, these are questions we came up with. 
Um, who does the program rating and building inspection on the house? If it's not a city staff person who trains this person uh, or who manages this person, how and who verifies that the inspection is accurate? If the city was to hire someone to manage this program, what skill sets would this person need to have? When exactly would upgrades happen? Um, it's seen from the proposal that it would be after the listing, but before sale. So how does this timeline influence the timeline for the buyer and seller? Let's say the buyer wants to close a deal within a month, but upgrades need to be made. How does that influence the timeline? Uh, and then there was a comment that there would be negotiation between the buyer and seller. And we're curious who would manage that negotiation between the buyer and seller as it pertains to the program. Um, costs, uh, if work is done before listing to comply, then the listing or sale price can't be a benchmark for the cost of the work required. Uh, so we would like the subcommittee to consider requiring a specific threshold score for all homes or a certain number of points that must be obtained. Uh, like let's say you have to jump at least five points, whichever is less. So you either have to meet say, a 10 or you have to go from a four to a nine, um, depending on the status of the home. If the buyer or seller can perform upgrades, then generally this would fall on the buyer and a seller's market. If this is an acceptable cost burden on the buyer, or is this an accessible, acceptable cost or burden on the buyer? What if they can no longer purchase the home because they don't have extra cash for upgrades but are being told they need to upgrade? And how would the actual amount spent on upgrades be verified? Then for enforcement, what are the consequences for non-compliance? Would the consequences be significant enough to incentivize compliance? And how would this impact buyers and sellers without much cash on hand? Would there be exceptions for financial hardship or some sort of financial threshold for requiring compliance? Let's say someone is trying to purchase a home uh, and they're being told they need to spend 20K on upgrades, but they have already depleted their savings account trying to purchase the home. What happens if they can't pull together the cash to make the upgrade? Um, just some questions. Those are our questions. Um, so I can pull them up if that's helpful, but I don't know if there are questions first from the group. I'll stop sharing so I can see you all. Well, um if I could just respond, because I'm the only subcommittee member here, that is a ton of questions, and they actually go into areas where we um, would recommend we don't go, such as who negotiates. It's up to the real estate agent and their clients to negotiate. So we were trying to keep this very simple, and I think you've you've brought up some really good points. I'm not going to be able to answer all the all these questions in in this meeting. I mean, this would go on for hours. Um, so what I suggest is I, I would have loved to have had these maybe ahead of time so I could have been prepared for that. Um, but again, the idea is that it's a very simple rating system that's done by just the standard building inspector that does, you know, that the real estate agents hire to do the building inspection. Uh, it's really on a um, kind of honors basis thing. You know, I looked at uh, City of Berkeley's um, BASO program is very labor intensive, involves a lot of staff time. They're doing a lot of stuff. We can't do that in Albany, so we're certainly not suggesting that. So the idea was to make it easy, simple things that anybody could see and determine they've been done. It would be sort of, um, since it's mandatory, uh, the buyer is going to want to have assurances that it's handled. But the negotiation of who pays for it is all done with the real estate agents and with the buyer and the seller. Um, usually it all just falls onto the buyer anyway, and it's all negotiated into the prices and the offers. So in Albany recently, it's a real uh, seller's market. We see prices going for 50% over asking. We're only asking that very small percentages of the list price be used to bring up the performance of the building. The, the other item about setting a benchmark, we don't want to do that. This is an incentivized program. And what that means is if someone wants to game it, if they look at certain things and they do them ahead of time of listing to make the house perform better, we've already won. They've done upgrades. 
So the whole thing is just an incentive to do certain upgrades. And if they can do them for less than the amount, like they may look at it and go, oh, our house, you know, if we if we listed today, it, the, we would be required based on how the features that we have or don't have um, and our score, we'd be required to spend $10,000. But we know we can spend $5,000 and or eight thousand dollars and actually get this to where we don't need to spend anything well that's great we've won again they've put the money into improving the performance of the home and doing things that we know are going to make it perform better and uh, emit less and be more clean so we didn't want to get into a lot of hand holding you know a lot of monitoring a lot of um checking and double checking it's just more an incentive program and uh, you know other things that get more into how do we know what was spent, when was spent, and all that. Um, I, I would have to uh, spend a lot more time, sort of, again, explaining the gist of it. Um, with the Beso program in Berkeley, they have a, an option. You know, you have to do the assessment. You have to um, hire a certain kind of person to do it, and you have to come up with what needs to be done, and that all has to be disclosed or there's an option just to make the buyer do it later. And almost 100% of them do that because it's just the way it is in the market. If you want the house, then you, you do the paint. Um, of course, there's flexibility in it. So if, if that kind of market changes, then it's more a negotiated thing. And probably you would have more of the sellers already preparing that like a, a pest report. It would already be there. Or like in Portland or... Minneapolis or um, uh, several other cities that um, I've heard about already have disclosure ordinances where you have to hire, you know, a skilled building. They use the the, the building energy score, um, which I have real qualms with because it doesn't really hit on electrification very much, but. Um, they're required, it's mandated, they do it. And these are very robust programs that are monitored by the city and they keep a database and you know involves a lot of staff time. And I, again, I don't see how we can do that in the little city of Albany. So um, I think what I would suggest is I can come up with a written response to all those questions. And um, Again, the, the idea was to keep it really simple and, and put it out there to incentivize people to do the right thing. Um, and, and that once people realized, you know, they, it's, you know it's, they, may, they just have to um, improve the home a certain amount. If they improve it so much before they list it that it doesn't need any improvements, then that's great too or they improve it a certain amount, and then they can hand off the rest of the improvements to the buyer and, and do it that way. I mean, it's, it's just uh, up to them. It's up to the buyer and seller to negotiate that between them. The city doesn't get in and tell them what to do. That would be a horrible plan because we're sort of nanny stating um, what people want to do when they sell their home, and we don't want to be in that situation. Um, I, I think the city council will get a lot of objections from all sorts of people when we presented that, that concept. So um, the other thing I was going to mention was that some, I, I've gotten a couple comments back from other people I've shared this with, where some of the, you know, I kept it very simple as far as here's your condition, here's, here's the first level of improvement, here's a, the best level of improvement. And, and you get one point for the first and two points for the next. Some people are saying, well, some of the improvements are much more cost uh, involved than others. And so you should maybe get more points for them. Again, the idea wasn't to, that's why I don't want to get in and say, you have to get this many points. The, the idea is not to do that. The idea is just to get them to do something to improve the building a certain amount. So again, we can give, if you give more points to certain things, um, then that just incentivizes them to do the higher pointed ones if they want to spend that amount of money. So I think that was a good comment and, and I think it makes sense. But again, the way to think about it is that these are incentives. Even though it's called a mandate, 
um, it's it's incentivizing sellers and and buyers to participate in a mutual agreement to improve the performance of the building at the point of sale or at the you, you know it's, it's, the price is established at the point of listing but then at the point of sale so it, and then it, and then it would be verified you know i guess you could do an inspection just confirm that that you know yes there's an induction range yes there's a heat pump water heater yes the panel went from 100 to 200 amps these are very simple things to check. They, they, they don't take anything more than someone walking in with a checklist and checking them off. So I don't know if it, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to entertain any other questions, but I just feel like in, in the context of this meeting, um, I can't get into the depth of, of the level of the question you've asked, but I would love to take those questions and then respond to them and then give, I think the best way to do it is just give some real case examples. Just say, look at this house. You know, right now it's got single glazed windows and no insulation and, you know, it's two bedroom this and, you know, the the uh, Zillow value is this much and could potentially go for that much if they listed at this and just say, here's what needs to happen. Now, if the, if the seller is incentivized ahead of time to do some things and he can do it for less than the percentage and get the score up to where, you know, he ends up not having to pay anything uh, per the evaluation. That, that's fine. That's great. All the, all the power to him. Um, but the, the idea is some, when, when a house changes hands, something needs to happen that makes it a better performer unless it's already a pretty good performer to begin with. So we're really trying to get those poor performers going. The other thing I'll mention is, is in, in, um, Berkeley has it in their BESO plan, is that if there's a major remodeling plan, like so, a lot of times people will buy the house and then within a year, you know, they're ripping it apart and they're making it into the home they really want. And they'll do all these certain upgrades uh, in, in tandem with that. So that would be another thing where as long as they file a permit within a year after buying the home, or we can come up with that verbiage. I don't know exactly what it is. And, and they um, make, you know, their remodel will make these efficiency and better performance changes. Then, you know, they, they don't need to spend the money ahead of time to get it to that. Just, you know, it can be incorporated into a major remodeling. So that's something Berkeley has also done with their base up plan. Um, the other thing that, um, Someone had shared with me that with these building disclosure, and again, the BASO is just a building energy savings BES uh, um, ordinance, I guess, is you have to, it, it doesn't really mandate that you need to do any of these things. It just means that you need to evaluate the house and come up with its performance values and what, what needs to happen to improve those. And that what they found is once people are aware of that, there's sort of like a 5%, around a 5% increase on those on some of those changes actually happening versus if you didn't do that. Some people say that's good. I think it's terrible. You know, I think we want to get more things to happen more quickly. And so that, therefore, that's the whole idea of having this mandate that has real numbers that says this is what people are going to spend. Now, a lot of people say, hey, you're just adding to the cost. Well, setting up a bid environment adds to the cost. Should we outlaw bidding on homes and first come, first serve? I mean, no one would go for that. There are all sorts of things that drive up the cost of housing. And uh, not very many people are concerned about those uh, until we come in and say, well, here we have one that you know we wanted to have at least a half to maybe one or 2%, depending how poorly the home is performing, uh, of the list price. Uh, go to these improvements. Most of the homes in Albany sell well over that um, above the list price. They're going up 50 to 100%, you know, some even 100% over list price. So I can't buy that one or 2% is going to blow the sale and people's savings are going to be drained. People that are buying the houses in Albany now have vast amount of resources and those resources should go towards making better improvements and, and better performance in the homes in Albany. So um, I think people eventually will just do that anyway. So most of it will become moot. 
but we can just rest assured they're thinking that way and they're incentivized that way. And I think that's where the, the, the program puts it out on the line that Albany is serious about homes performing better uh, and that that should be a concern even before you sell your home. And it actually, you know, anybody in Albany that owns a home and is thinking of selling it even four or five years out of the down the line, they can see, oh, if I've got a poor performer, I better start thinking now and not wait till the last minute, like they do with the sewer lateral. And you know, don't have to do it until the very last part. And then, you know, the buyer pays for it. And you just ladle it on them. So anyway, that's kind of my summation to the gist of, of I didn't answer all your questions, but that's okay. We definitely don't need to answer them all tonight. Um, and we can send them to you. And one of the other recommendations on the agenda is to see if anyone wants to join your subcommittee, because I know you're kind of acting as a um, lone subcommittee member now. Um, yeah. We can send them to the subcommittee and we can bring this back next month. Yeah. One thing I'll note is just that um, I think part of our thought for bringing this at the meeting tonight instead of just sending it to you, Nick, was so that all of the other members of the committee could kind of look over the questions and think about them, pose their own comment on what they think the answers to some of those questions might be. And then you can take all of that when you go back and, and think through the answers. Right. And and I'm I'm guessing there are probably some participants or attendees that are interested in commenting on this too. I mean I could I could again I'm in the process of doing some tweaks and I don't want to just bring up my revised sort of schedule of how it's rated and how that works. I think it would be good to do that next time and try to call in and respond. I mean, you give me a lot to think about. Um, and if anybody, you know, I, I'd certainly welcome uh, uh, anybody else to, who would, you know, I could bounce ideas off of. Um, Harshita is really great to do that with. Although I have to admit, we spent, you know, we just sort of spent minimal time together on that. So um, if, and again, I wanted to say that if people wanted, you know, I can share my screen and show that sort of, um, well, I had a presentation, we could bring up the um, examples if people wanted that or, or, you know, I don't want to stop questions. I'm more than happy to field as many, but I, I think, um, I think that's a good pass. I wish, I wish there was a way we could do that. Somehow those could come in so I could have a prepared response. We wouldn't have to wait a whole nother meeting cycle to get back to them, but it's probably worth it um, just, to, just to have people think about it more. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so like Michelle said, and thank you, Michelle. Do any other members? I see Committee Member Larson just raised his hand. Yeah, I was just gonna, so are we are we adding more questions? Because this th that was a really good list of questions and really great discussion. Thanks, Nick, for for talking it through just you know in in the meeting here. Um, just something that occurs to me, you know, we were talking about the buyer and the seller. There's a lot of money changing hands there. But I was just thinking back to my first house purchase, which is actually my only house purchase. Um, back then, we scrape together as much as we could for the down payment. So that, you know, the down payment is the, the buyer's responsibility. You get to leverage the, you know, the loan to, to finance everything else. So that's how people get into houses is because they can finance and, and get, you know, the leverage of the 10% or 20% down. Do you know, or maybe the question asked to add to the list is, are these improvements something that can be added to the sales price? will a bank add those into the financing or is it truly the buyer having to finance this and you know to, to, to fund this out of their own pocket i honestly don't know the answer you know to that because i think it'd make a big difference because you're talking about you know if it's financeable then you're really coming up with 20 percent of the cost of the um of the improvements whereas if a buyer has to you know, do twenty thousand dollars more than they were already going to do. If that's all out of their own pocket, then that's a different equation. And I agree, Nick. You know, we're talking small percentages of house prices right now. But you know, first-time home buyers, I'm just you know trying to think of that side of it as well. 
Yeah, no, it's an interesting point, but the same thing comes up with a pest report. You know, I, I mean, a lot of times people say, you know, here's the pest report, it's $40,000, you know, you're buying as is. So again, you know, the buyers have to manage that in some way. I, I think the percentages we're talking about, um, you know, the when, when um, people buy homes, you know, you, of course you have to, the, the, <laughs> It's crazy these days that they're doing all cash, right? So they're not getting a loan. Um, but that's a whole that's a, that's a whole another factor. Um, but if you're if you're getting a loan, you still, you know you have to have the appraisal um, at least pencil out to where the house is worth what you're getting. You know, well, I don't know if they, you know it's got to be a certain percentage of the sales price. So. Um, you know, those are all things that, that I, I, I don't think the small amount we're incentivizing people with on this is it's just a drop in the bucket in the whole big range of things that happen during a um, cost transfer that's sort of shuttled into the financing. Um, you know, It does it? I mean, it's not zero impact. I, I agree, but it's an incentive. So again, what I'm what I'm sort of focusing on is this: this is giving a heads up to people that, like, when you sell your home, you need to um, be aware it needs to perform within a certain amount. If it doesn't, then certain upgrades have to be funded at that time, and and then you negotiate who performs them and how they're financed. Mm -hmm. and who, you know, maybe the seller leaves some money on the table. I mean, you know, if they're getting if they're getting twenty percent more than they were even thinking they were going to get. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not you know a bit you know it's not unwarranted that they leave a little bit on the table, um, especially since they were trying you know if the house is a poor performer anyway. So it's it you know it's one of those things. It's not the straw that's going to break the camel's back. That's more interest rates. They're going up too. So yeah. everyone could say, well, you're breaking, they're always going to be breaking someone's back. You know, people that just can't participate in the market, right? Because they yeah. can't do an all cash offer 50% over asking. You know, but in that kind of money stream, I I I just can't fathom that some dollars can't be thrown at improving. If, it, if the house needs an improvement or needs some electrification, which we all agree it does, yeah. it can happen at that time where people are really putting piles of money on the table. You know, I, I doubt this mandate is going to stop house sales in Albany. Uh, you know, it, it, it's um, anyway. I, I, yeah, no, those are those are good points. Um, I, in, you're right. I and I was just thinking, just uh, sort of on the practical level of like, but yeah, okay, all right, fair enough. Well, you know, everybody talks about you know a little ma, you know, here's the young family starting a home, and you know it's so expensive, and blah blah blah. But you know, when you have these bid situations, I don't know if you've ever been in them, but you know, do you want it? Are you willing to pay for it? You know, nobody gives a crap about that when that's happening, right? right, so, right. <laughs> um, we're a capitalist society. You have to have capital to participate in these exchanges. So yeah. we're just saying, you know, you got to put some of that capital towards better performance of the home. Right, right. And and either you'll do it later, and we and we're totally happy with that, and we're glad to see that, or or you work it out amongst you as it transfers now, and 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 either the buyer picks it up or the seller does some things or. Maybe they even do it before they even list it, and it's a moot point because they've handled it already. It's just incentivizing people to do that. Yeah. Um, sorry, can we go back to the costs questions? Um, Yeah, um, I guess are we are we moving into discussion on on this item or no? I think this should just be questions for okay. either staff or committee member Peterson. But 
we can go to public comment if we feel like we're ready for discussion. Which maybe we should just to be safe because it's kind of questions and discussion at this point. So Chair Fassoon, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, let's move it on to public comment and then we'll go on to discussion. Okay, if any of members of the public would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. This is the opportunity to make a public comment on this item. Okay, great. One member of the public. David Wemmer. Um, yeah, I think this, um, you know, excellent, uh, you know, this is an ex excellent proposal. I, you know, I just want to, uh, you know, support it. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, currently been well thought out and, um, you know, I think uh, you know, moving it forward, you know, of course, there'll be some refinements and such, but I think foundationally it's, uh, it's solid. And I, you know, I like the idea of, uh, you know, little Albany uh, progressing, you know, this progressive um, measure and uh, uh, leading the, leading the charge. Um, you know, I just, uh, the clock, every day I just hear that clock ticking on climate change and, you um, you know, we just we just have to be bold, and uh, and I'm hoping we uh, just keep moving this forward and um, show some leadership and get it done. That's it. Okay, Lucinda Young. Uh, yes, I also would like to echo support for this. Um, proposal. I realize there are quite a few details that need to be worked out and it is very much still in the kind of general um, stage um, and that there's quite a bit more work to do. But I think um, it is a terrific idea. We've got to somehow uh, reach the inventory of, of homes in Albany and reaching it at the point of sale or the point of listing, um, I think is, is just the way to go. So despite the details, and I think there were some excellent questions raised, uh, many of which need to be answered, um, I would like to see the committee continue to pursue this. Thank you. I don't see any other members of the public with their hand raised. Back to you, Chair Fassoon. Yeah, so let's go into discussion now. I can pull up the cost slides again for committee member Chen. Okay. Oh, I, I'm good on that. You don't want it anymore? Oh, um, we can, I guess we can move it up. <laughs> yeah, the, I just missed the last point when um, we were going through them, so. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I'll stop my screen share then. Yeah, I guess one one aspect of um, this program that I was a little bit curious about, um, looking through Berkeley's program, and I think San Francisco and a couple of other cities, my understanding is that um, it's a little bit more of a tiered system where there are a greater number of requirements for buildings that have a large amount of square footage or commercial buildings, things of that nature. I'm a little curious, like, I think at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is something on the order of, I think, around 12,000 metric tons of CO2 um, based on our latest KPIs. So I am kind of curious, like, um, it seems like a lot of staff questions here seemed really focused on uh, kind of enforcement and inspection. Um, it seems like if that is the main concern, uh, those concerns might be a lot easier to manage if you know the volume of these requests was pretty low because it was based on you know large square footage buildings or something of that nature um, and. You know, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, uh, if there's like kind of a breakdown of, you know, what the environmental impact would be of, you know, having a mandate on buildings of a certain size versus, um, you know, all homes, or if there's 
sort of some kind of trade off between you know how much of them how, how many people this affects versus um yeah like sort of the ability of large commercial buildings to maybe be able to handle these requests more uh gracefully so i don't i'm not asking for an answer from the subcommittee or from staff but i think it is a question that i would love to sort of get some insight on Speaking just from a from a data perspective in terms of building sizes and stuff, I you know I don't know anything off the top of my head, but we could certainly look into that if the committee and the subcommittee was interested. Generally speaking, most of the buildings, including the commercial buildings in Albany, are pretty small. Um, there are some larger ones, but it's just based off kind of the numbers I have floating around in my head. It's a relatively small percentage. But um, but yeah, we could definitely look into it and, and think about building size or, or other factors. Yeah, I, you know, the initial thoughts I had on this was it was just for residential homes. If you look at Berkeley's pro BASO program, they have a whole different program for commercial buildings and larger size buildings. And those, those um, that program mandates that they have to they have to yearly report an energy profile or I forget exactly what it is and it's a much bigger thing I wasn't taking that on right now and plus Albany doesn't really have a lot of those um, bigger buildings here we do have the big condos down on Albany Hill um, so then you know that's actually an exclusion of is, is if you're selling a condo like all those condos would really wouldn't be covered by this because they're part of a larger much bigger building and we would have to come up with some uh, other way to approach that so again this was just seen as really residential home sales type upgrades just to make sure that people you know if, as they get ready to sell the home aren't throwing in those big gas ranges they're throwing in induction ranges or they're putting in a ev charger and they're sort of moving the needle towards um being uh you know net zero emitters and more electrification. So um, again, yeah, it can get really complex. And, and I, I just viewed this as, I forget, maybe Michelle remembers off the top of her head how many home sales happen in Albany per year, but it, you know, it's a certain number and it'd be nice if we knew those homes were gonna be better performers after being sold. Um, it's just a way to address that. The other thing I was thinking is that it, it establishes kind of a foot in the door for later requirements for just homes in general. You know, that, that as we get closer to these um, goals of trying to reduce, uh, you know, emissions, you know, I'm assuming, you know, if, we, if we're serious about it and not wishy-washy and just continue to kick the can down the road, by the time we get to 2045, you'll literally have your gas meter severed from your home. So, um, or that'll, or it'll be illegal to burn gas or something of that nature. Now you wouldn't impose that right now, but you need to do a lot of incentivizing and changes and requirements and stuff, especially with existing housing stock down the line. So you gotta make some kind of beachhead where people realize this is coming and it's going to happen, and um, every change is painful, but you got to do ones that are um, acceptable enough that people will go along with them and then get used to them, and then you can start applying them um, in other situations too. So that's kind of the the other concept of this is that we're looking at a long duration of time. Um, this current proposal has the flexibility of changing percentages changing scores, you know, making, adding more things. And it has a certain degree of flexibility you could use to make it um, sort of ramp up where initially it isn't that big a deal. You can get, you can comply with it with that, without much pain. But as we get closer to what, where we really need people to do more, it can become more demanding. So again, I, I see it as sort of a phasing in type approach and it's a first step. 
And that's why it doesn't cover every single possible type of property in, in Albany. Yeah, I guess the other comment I wanted to make, um, I I really, the questions from staff about, um, I guess, sort of uh, imposing costs on sellers really did resonate with me. I moved to Albany two years ago. I bought a home. Um, it was really, really difficult to do so. Um, I think if we're happening today, I wouldn't be on this committee. Um, I probably would be able to move to Albany. I have a number of friends who are you know, my age who are starting out and you know trying to raise young children. Many members happening on your mic. Sorry, one second. Not to interrupt your speech, but yeah, it was hard to hear you at the end there. Sorry, is this better? It seems like do you have a cord that goes with your your headphones uh i think so yeah i think it's when the cord touches something we hear like a crackling noise oh that's really exciting <laughs> um is this better yes it's quieter but it's less crackly yeah i, I mean i guess i just really wanted to make the point that you know, folks who don't live in Albany today don't really even get representation on this committee to influence this decision. So I, I think it's a little important to at least consider consider that a little bit. And, you know, like um, one other like thing I was thinking about recently was uh, my parents visited from Georgia. Um, they, they live uh, in a suburb of Atlanta and, you know, every year they need to keep the heat on at, during the winter because it gets a lot colder there. If they were able to move to Albany, even if they did zero energy efficiency upgrades, it would have a much lower carbon footprint in the United States. So like, I think thinking globally is also a little bit important. The more people that we can to get, uh, can house in areas like Albany where we have mild climate, has like maybe a larger impact on the environment than you know optimizing our individual carbon footprint. So, um, yeah, that was the only other point I wanted to sort of bring up that I don't think was previously discussed. Yeah, I'm not sure, quite sure how to respond to that. I mean, you can't make everybody happy. Would you suggest so then we do nothing? Status quo. Um, no, yeah. actually, I I think my my recommendation there would be considering the impact of enabling more people to move to Albany versus saving on the order of 6,000 metric tons of carbon a year if this program were a knockout success. Um, I don't know. I, I, don't think, I don't think one or 2% price impact is going to open the floodgates to people coming to Albany. It, 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 I just don't buy that. And I, I think... The idea here is that we do something that then is scalable and other communities can do. I, I mean, again, you know, it's just a shell game then, you know, if you want to move people around and go where it's cheaper and, and get, you know, then, you know, let's just keep burning whatever's cheaper. And so I, I don't know. I, I think, you I, I mean, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, if you move to Albany at all today in the least efficient possible home that's in Albany, you're probably better than 80 or 90 percent of the U.S. in terms of your energy usage because of the mild climate, the fact that we opt you into renewable energy by default. We live in a community that really values, um, you know, environmental impact. So, like, I, I would love to see the numbers on this, but my intuitive sense is there's at least some trade-off between, you know, affordability or enabling people to move to Albany and optimizing our existing pretty good environmental footprint. I'm not suggesting that we do nothing. It's just sort of, if there is something where it's clearly a trade-off between one and the other, which this mandate may very well be, then, you know, we should figure out which part of that trade-off is actually better for the environment. So you want to do a study where you find out how many people are moving from more energy intensive locations to Albany per year, and then, ask them whether they would move if 2% more cost was involved. 
I don't even get, here's the thing I was looking at. We're burning carbon every day, a lot of gas used in Albany. Yeah, we're not creating all of global climate change, but it's repeated endlessly all across this whole country. And uh, how can we get from doing that to not doing that? Um, you know, it, are we just, you know, should we just sit back and hope it all happens by itself? Can we incentivize it? Are there ways to do that with minimal pain? Um, certainly if we do it, it makes us better than other places that are worse, but what's wrong with getting better? I mean, then we become a role model for um, trying to make this change happen. We, we just know at some point the fossil fuels have to stop, right? And so it doesn't matter how much they are. Um, it, it, I think what matters is that you don't do it anymore. And if you can take methodologies that work and show how to implement them and other communities can use them, then you can scale that up and have a bigger impact. Albany isn't going to stop climate crisis, even if we all just you know totally went out and sledgehammered our gas meters today, tomorrow. I mean, that's not the point. And I guess what I get worried about is that we, we sit around looking at every little nuance of it. And um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure whether we would ever accomplish anything then. I don't think we would try anything. We would, we would analysis paralysis ourselves into doing nothing. So uh, I, I, I mean, if it just seems like a kind of way out there thing to say, you know, I know someone that lives in this area and they would love to come to Albany. What was their job in Albany? No. Um, I, I, I mean, there are probably a lot of people in Albany that would like to move to Georgia. <laughs> I don't know. What does that mean? If you're going to move to Albany, you have to have a certain income to pay for a almost $2 million house. That's a reality. Just saying if people are buying $2 million houses, they better be really good performers. If we can't do it, nobody can do it. Right? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I do feel like in some cases the, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good or, or something along those lines. So um, I take your point. I, I think it's, it's definitely a good point. It's just, you know, like, um, there's a there's a whole range of possibility here between um, having absolutely zero greenhouse gas emissions in Albany or preventing you know greenhouse gas emissions from neighboring communities and I think maybe being a little myopic about our own greenhouse gas emissions might not be the best global strategy and just in general um, I don't know like what we're talking about here is six thousand metric tons maybe of greenhouse gas emissions, like if you were to put a price on it, it would be on the order of, of I don't know, like $200,000 or something a year in, in carbon offset credits or something like that, right? So um, it's really not, it's really not that big of cost savings for, for greenhouse gas emissions. And there might be more economically efficient ways to achieve that goal. If that's well, I doing. eagerly await you presenting those, but let I me, mean this kind of reminds me of when Michael Barnes was on the council and we would present these things to the city council and he'd say, what Albany does doesn't matter. It's like spitting in the ocean. What you need to be concerned about is India and China. Albany has, we, we don't need to, you know, we shouldn't worry about this at all. And that is such a wrong argument. The U S is responsible for most of the carbon that's out in the atmosphere, India, where they're suffering miserably right now, and where, yes, someday they will pump out more, um, they only put 2% of the carbon into the, into the atmosphere, and they're suffering miserably. So we need to do our, you know, us first world Americans who just blew carbon out like crazy for decades, we have to do something, and we have to feel some pain and do that. And, and I, I, I completely disagree with just saying, well, we're only going to do, I mean, if you compartmentalize, uh, I don't know, that's a defeatist argument to just compartmentalize the carbon savings we're going to do and then say that's so in insignificant, it doesn't matter. Then nothing matters. Nothing matters at all. We should all just stop and roll down the hill and 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 do nothing. I, I, I just, 
I mean, if you, if you could, you know, the idea here is just to try to get homes performing better. I agree, it's it, it is a small change, but we need to do that. We're not even doing that now. Right now, when I go to an open home, they've plugged in a brand new gas range. No one's even thinking about, you know, that it should should have been an induction range. So how do you go from that mentality to where we're going to be where carbon emission is down to zero? We're not, unless we get serious about it. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you, you know, if get, I don't think getting serious is trying to, you know, find if, you know, we should maybe do a program to convince people in Georgia to move to Albany and fund them so they could go to a place that has a three times cost of living factor than in Georgia. I don't get it, you know. Yeah, uh, that's, sorry, that wasn't my proposal at all. But, uh, well, you said someone living in Georgia where they were spending a lot of energy could come here and live for less, I think you were trying to say, or, or at least pollute less. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess my, my overall question is if we have a particular program where there's an enormous trade-off between and you know these are open questions. I don't I don't think it's necessarily a trade-off, but if there's a program where there's a huge trade-off between you know allowing people to move into Albany and having an environmental impact, like it's not entirely clear to me that you know where we could fall on that trade-off because I think the actual overall environmental global impact is really affected by that trade-off. And um, yeah, I. I know we can't get perfect data on that, but um, if only you know any insight we could have into that trade-off, I think would be. Well, I'm not going to. Chair Pasoon. Hi, sorry to interrupt, but I, I think that we should um, end that particular part of the conversation. I think that's that's good discussion. Mm -hmm. We've we've probably exercised that enough, um, and uh, I, I appreciate you know Nick's got. The information as far as the questions now, I'm looking forward to next month's discussion with with that. So I think that would probably be, I would suggest that we um, either take a different question or or move on. And I would suggest we're about four minutes from our meeting end time, nine o'clock. So if the committee would like to extend the meeting, uh, someone should make a motion to do so. Since I'm already un unmuted, I'll go ahead and make a motion to extend the meeting. I'll, I don't know what the agenda is, but 15 minutes would be my proposal. Okay. I second. Okay. Uh, committee member Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Aye. Committee member Muhammad? Aye. Committee member Peterson? Aye. Chair Fassoon? Aye. Okay, meeting extended to 9.15. I just like to weigh in. I, I agree with Eric. I mean, I sorry, I get kind of adamant about certain things, but um, uh, Daniel, you, you know, certainly include any, can, can you collect questions from other, I mean, I, I think um, Eric had a good point. There might be other questions and we could go on and on with this. Should we have a certain time frame to get questions in, and then I'll I'll put responses to those. Yeah, that works. We should, if committee members are going to send me questions outside of the public meeting, we should at least make sure we're answering them in a public forum. Um, so we'll just need to make sure we answer each question publicly next meeting. Yeah, what I what I was suggesting was you would collect if there are more questions. Maybe people don't, but mm -hmm. at least you know you could collect them by you know, in the next week and then get them to me and then I will respond to them in the meeting. Yeah, that works. I'll come, I'll come back with responses to all the questions you asked and any of the others, or at least, okay. you know, what my thoughts are on that. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not really an expert on this, mm -hmm. this concept. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, one other staff recommendation that we did have um, is to update the subcommittee membership if there are other members that would like to be a part of the subcommittee beyond just committee member Peterson.
we can have a one person subcommittee, but just yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to. I mean, this thing has kind of reached a certain point where, I mean, I've got the spreadsheet and, and I, I understand the questions, but I'm I'm more than happy to uh, if, if people want to discuss it further. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, listen to what people have to say. And as long as it's, um, you know, looks like we can um, iron stuff out and keep keep this sort of moving along. And it seemed like public comment was somewhat supportive of it. Okay, subcommittee of one. Is there any more discussion the committee would like to have on this item? Uh, no more discussion, but I guess I just did want to highlight the questions that I guess I took down in my notes um, mm -hmm. during the meeting. I think there was a question on whether uh, bank financing could be applied to potential improvements. Um, I think there's a question of, is there a trade-off between a home electrification mandate and sort of the environmental impact of excluding certain people from moving into Albany? And um, I think there was a, a question on, um, I don't know exactly how to frame it, but just uh, making sure that um, both potential residents of Albany as well as current residents of Albany are represented in the decision in some form. Did you get those questions, Community Member Peterson? Um, if you could just, I'm assuming there'll be others too that people will get to. So if you could just put it all into one thing, that would be useful for me. You need me to write down the comments he just said? Yeah, and any others that people provide later, unless we're just gonna, is the idea you make your your questions come now and there and then there will be no more? They have, they have to be presented in the public forum. No, I just didn't know if you, I think committee member Chen was providing comments to you. I didn't know if you wrote them down. I can. I, I wasn't writing them down, no. I can go back and listen to the recording if you don't want to write them down. Um, we'll chat. Yeah. Um, so if anyone else has questions or comments, please feel free to email them to me. Um, we can do a deadline of one week and then I'll send them to committee member Peterson. So if you could send them to me my next Wednesday, that would be great. And Daniel, I can re-listen to the recording and note your comments if you didn't already write them down. I'll send you a follow-up email. Thank you. That is super helpful. <laughs> Thank you, committee member Chen. Thank you both. Okay, Chair Fasoon, I believe okay, we need to move on. Okay, with that, it looks like we can move on to item 6-3, which is Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee on discussing whether this subcommittee should continue for the remainder of 2022. Um, and if it does, if it is determined that it will continue determining scope of work and establishing membership. So you and I are the subcommittee, right? Yeah. So, you know, we didn't really get a, have a chance to talk about this, so I guess we could talk about it now. Um, I, I, when, when Laura was on, she, we, we tried to do that, um, the community forum, and we did get some uh, interaction with community. I don't think that we achieved what we wanted to out of that, and we found it very difficult and very resource and time intensive for the subcommittee to try to 
engage the community that way. And so I, I, I don't think that that was an effective use of our subcommittee time and resources. Um, I know that Chair Fassoon, you um, had expressed an interest in engaging the um, students uh, especially. And I think that that's a, a fantastic um, idea. And if you want to pursue that, I would be happy to stay on the subcommittee with you and, and to the extent that I can help with that. Um, but I don't know that I have any new ideas for community engagement that I want to pursue at this point. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely would be happy to kind of come up with something and how we can engage the students and be happy to chat with you on kind of like a strategy for that and like how we're going to approach that. Okay. Um, but yeah, definitely won't. Oh, Committee Member Peterson. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just had a thought. Um, and Lizzie, maybe this is something you could come in on. So having um, subcommittees, they're usually ad hoc. And once they're done with what they're doing, they're ended. I would love, I would suggest that we form a subcommittee to look at student involvement and, um, you know, in helping get the word out about the climate action adaptation plan, you know, that we have a subcommittee that specifically focuses on how to bring that to the schools and the students and get get the community a little bit more energized and 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 involved. Anyone like that idea? Chair Fassoon, what were you gonna say earlier? I, I honestly forgot. I I don't think it was anything super important though. I'm sure it was, but if it comes back to you, please feel free to say it. Wait, uh, can you have a question in response to that? So do you mean it would be in replacement of the existing subcommittee for outreach and engagement, or would it be like an additional one focusing on bringing the information to schools? So for the Brown Act, you're okay to have these non-public meetings of less than a quorum on what are called ad hoc subcommittees. You can't form committees, subcommittees that are just there in perpetua. That's not allowed. That's That becomes a violation. Okay. So um, my idea is we should just sunset the outreach committee. They did their outreach and um, tried a few things and I think Eric summed that up really well. And I'm I'm suggesting that a new subcommittee be formed that was specific on getting student and uh, school student participation in um, promoting the climate action adaptation plan. I okay, guess. thank you for clarifying. Or, or something like that. And I would be very interested to hear what you students think of that. Yeah, I mean, committee member Muhammad, do you have ideas on that? I don't want to put you on the spot, but we're the students here, so. Um, I think I'd be really interested in that, um, like outreaching to students as well, because um, I think like students are like, we're going to grow up and we're going to be adults and we're going to be kind of like in the world and we will have to um, combat climate change and stuff like that. So I think it's a great idea to um, go out and talk about this stuff to students and younger people. Yeah, for sure. So if you would be interested in joining that subcommittee, then it would be myself, committee member Larson, and um, committee member Muhammad. Um, but yeah, I also echoing what committee member Muhammad was talking about, definitely would be interested in the ideas that you were talking about, um, committee member Peterson, and that approach to it. I think that's great. Thank you. I, I, I think it's something you guys are well suited to and, and are certainly capable of, of moving on. So I, I would, uh, do we need to make a motion to create a subcommittee? Yeah, I think that that was, I, I mean, just speaking from being on the subcommittee at this point, I think that's a great suggestion to, you know, retire the old committee or old subcommittee and create a new one so that it has a new, you know, more focused scope and, and charter. I think that's a that's a really good suggestion. So definitely support that. 
And what would you like this new subcommittee to be called, if not the Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee? I'll let the students name it. What do you think? The student what? My internet cut out. Oh, I the Lizzie was asking what should we call this subcommittee, and I was saying let's let I the, heard stu the student something. Let's let the students name it. I, oh, I can you remember Mohammed? Do you have any ideas? Um, I think we could just put like the word youth in front of it, and just like that's like the committee. Yeah, like uh, youth or maybe even student might be better, just because we are outreaching okay. specifically to students mm -hmm. in the district. Um. But yeah, we could just change it to like student outreach and engagement yeah. subcommittee. Great. Sounds good. And just to clarify for me, the members are committee member Mohammed, Chair Fasoon, and is committee member Larson still a member? I, you know, I don't really have any expertise in, in student engagement at this point. My kids are out of school. So <laughs> um, if you, I, I wouldn't mind if you guys, felt comfortable running it on your own if you wanted to have another member um i but if you're if you're i think you guys would probably run with this really well and not sure i would contribute too much i mean i would but <laughs> i mean yeah i would try, as as I would try. <laughs> um, as much as we would appreciate everything i definitely think you know we don't want to add extra up on you and since we do already have just the advantage of being students ourselves yeah that will probably make things just um yeah you know yeah. i'm sure why don't you go with it and and you can check in with us if you need you know help with yeah direction or whatever awesome can you remember peterson yeah and i'm wondering lizzie is it um i mean i don't want to tell staff what to do but i mean is it worthwhile to have this new subcommittee meet with staff to um, maybe get a little boned up on the climate action adaptation plan um, and some of the things you guys feel, you know, just to get staff input on what, what you think students could be helpful on? I think they're welcome to reach out to us if they'd like, but they're a subcommittee of this committee. So I think the responsibility of providing feedback actually falls on you all. Um, so I encourage you to be that resource for them as well. Well, but they, I thought the Brown Act prohibited us having any at public meetings during the subcommittee updates piece. We could chat about it at that point every meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I have a motion, but I don't know who made it and there's been no second. Well, I'll, I'll make it my motion. So a motion that the student outreach and engagement subcommittee be formed and that it has uh, Chair Bassoon and Member Mohammed uh, participating. I second. Okay. Committee Member Chen? Uh, aye. Committee Member Larson? Aye. Committee Member Mohammed? Aye. Committee Member Peterson? Aye. Chair Fassoon? Aye. Great. Motion carries. Um, we should take public comment on this item because it was an item we discussed, but before we do that, we also should have a motion to extend the meeting um, to allow for that public comment and allow us time to wrap up. I'll make a motion to extend it by um, till 925. I think that should be enough. Mm -hmm. Just always keep in mind public comment. You want to bank on at least having three to six minutes, but I think 925 should be fine. Second. Okay. One second. Committee member Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Aye. Committee member Mohammed? Aye. Committee member Peterson? Aye. Chair Fassoon? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Um, we should open it up to public comment. 
like, yep, and I see someone already has their hand raised. Okay. At this point, if anyone would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. We'll pull up the clock. Lucinda Young. Um, yes, I am uh, very glad to hear that a subcommittee has been formed um, focused on Albany High students. I think there is a, um, a huge amount of interest among young people and, and, a, and also a lot of anxiety and frustration about what can be done. I think this is a really good resource uh, to tap into the, the Albany High School community. I just wanted to uh, throw out, I think, a, I live half a block from Albany High and I spend a lot of time walking both during school hours and after hours. Uh, one of the things I think that there's really a need for some education and also engagement around is um, there seems to be very little um, understanding of proper recycling, composting, and landfill. And um, I think there's a uh, probably a, a widespread lack of understanding between uh, of the connection between waste management and climate change. So I think there's a lot of potential there uh, for educating and getting um, the high school engaged in that. And I did want to just mention briefly, uh, going back to the previous agenda item, which there was a public comment taken um, after the discussion. Um, and I think in evaluating the importance of a climate action, it is um, wrong to simply look at the carbon reduction from that particular activity you also have to look at the fact that this action we are a role model for the state for the nation for the world and we can't simply say oh well this uh this action is going to save x amount of carbon emissions estimated end of story that's not the whole story um it's real we're in a climate crisis and it's really important that we model for the rest of the state and the rest of the world and it did concern me that there was a suggestion that um, because our carbon footprint in Albany is less, thank goodness, than it is in many parts or most parts of the country, that basically we should be sitting on our hands. That very much concerned me, that suggestion. Thank you. Any other members of the public who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, back to you, Chair Fassoon. And I just will clarify for future meetings, we always take public comment after questions, not after discussion. So if you have public comment, please make it before discussion so that it informs discussion. But back to you, Chair Fassoon. Um, am I allowed to respond to Lucinda? Briefly, yeah. Okay, um, I'd just like to briefly touch on, I know she was talking about in the beginning, like lack of knowledge. Um, and I wanted to connect this because we did just establish the subcommittee of student outreach and engagement and we can apply um, the feedback that Lucinda was talking about, about like, for example, lack of knowledge about how issues like waste relate to climate change and stuff. Um, and I know back at the school, um, both committee member Muhammad and I are on the high school's climate action or the climate team, green team. Um, so I think we've kind of been working on stuff like that, but I think now that this newly established subcommittee um, is in works, I think we can kind of um, connect those two, hopefully to educate the students more and have that gap be closed. Um, so yeah. But otherwise, yeah, we can move on. Um, let's move on to subcommittee updates, item 6-4. Um, starting with the Zero Emission Transportation Subcommittee. Um, Eric and I are on that, and we we talked, we, we had some communication today, and I did create a list, although going through that and discussing it will probably take us over time. Um, so I'm not sure if, if uh, well, what do you think, Eric? Should we just throw the list up and get... We need a motion to extend um, 
because I doubt we'll finish it in six minutes. So that's up to the committee. I wouldn't mind um, working on a little bit more with you and making, you know, having a little, having more of a dedicated time in the next meeting. Yeah. I okay. I agree. So let's just say that, that uh, we'll hold that one off till next time. Okay, since we didn't discuss this item, uh, we can move on. Chair Fasun. Okay, let's move on to item seven, which is future agenda items. Zero emission transportation subcommittee update. Yes, that's default on there. You got it. Yeah, I was just, there's some actually something I was going to suggest falls square under that. So I'm not going to put it as a separate separate item. Um, one thing I was wondering is sometimes we'll suggest future agenda items. And I'm assuming someone's keeping track of that because they don't always become the next agenda item. They're not on the next agenda. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I brought up about the uh, vehicle electrification and how I feel we should have the police cars on there sooner rather than later. Um, but I'm more than happy to discuss that under the zero emission transportation subcommittee portion. Um, or should I request that it be put on separate item? Uh, the reason we haven't put it on the agenda is because there's no update at this time. Um, we're having discussions internally, but at this time, there's not really anything to bring to the committee. Yeah, um, but, but I was pushing it because I, I, I don't want I mean, if, if is an update going to come? I mean, if you know, it was a ten-year plan, and they weren't in there at all. And is it when is it coming back? We don't know at this time, but we have flagged it to leadership, so um, it's on staff radar. It's not been forgotten. It's something we talk about weekly internally. So. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I'll talk about it again. So I won't make it a separate item. I'll just bring it up under the zero emission transportation subcommittee. Okay. I also have a note for the uh, CPUC discussion on NEM and potential council recommendation. Um, that's a good point, and I'm 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 more than willing to provide some background and information on that, and and even put together um, a proposed, um, I don't know if it'd be a proclamation or just a letter that would go. Okay, uh, yeah, we can discuss that, that. Particular item, would it be possible to have a representative from EBC attend as well? From, sorry, who was that? From EBC. Um, we can ask them, yeah. Or at least I can probably get a written statement from them if they aren't able to make it. I know this is the same evening as their board meetings every single month, um, but I can see what we can do. I could, uh, I, I think EBCE has actually submitted something to the CPUC and I could track that down and at least make, you know, have that as part, make that available. So it could go out as information to the subcommittee members. Is that information that will come out to us before the next meeting so we can review before the meeting? Well, um, Lizzie, I mean, I'm assuming if, right. if this is going to be an agenda item and we want to have something, I mean, I, I'm more than happy to provide any backup material uh, you'd need, or would you want to pre prepare your own staff report? Um, we'll probably prepare our own staff report. And you're welcome to provide additional materials. I think yeah. for the sake of time, maybe we should connect offline about this one specifically. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to be, I, I'm, I'm starting a month of travel. So um, if you could just let me know, I'm going to uh, be at the next meeting just remotely from Wisconsin. <laughs> um, but if if there's a deadline when you would like material, just let me know. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, we should open it up to public comment. Chair Fasun. 
Yeah, let's open it up to public comment for the sake of time. Okay, I see Lucinda has her hand raised. Lucinda Young? Yes, uh, just real quickly, um, uh, I think it was last month, Michelle gave a really excellent presentation on the uh, change to the building code um, proposal, which would prohibit gas and new construction. And I just wanted to make sure that hadn't dropped off the agenda. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be bringing back uh, more updates on that. Um, we have to wait for some um, some updates in the state building code first, but that will be returning. Any other members of the public who would like to speak on future agenda items? Seeing none, back to you, Chair Fassoon. Okay, with that, it looks like we can start adjourning the meeting. Um, our next meeting will be July 20th. Um, and yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Uh,